A rebuilt Stuart Major beam engine in the workshop, part two. Dismantling the engine and looking at the problems in more detail. As I get further into this engine, I can still see that it's very well made. So I do come to the conclusion, we either have two builders here, we have a guy who built the engine initially and someone else who fitted it all together, or the guy who built the engine was a very good engineer and not too good a fitter. Temporarily I'm replacing the bearing cap so I don't lose it, and for those of you who are very eagle-eyed, you will have noticed of course, that I have reversed the top cap. It's the wrong way round. I just wanted to see how it fitted. Anyway, on now to the crankshaft. The first thing to do is to put the micrometer on this crankshaft and check it for wear. And the good news is it's not worn, but the entire crankshaft is one thou under three quarters of an inch. For a crankshaft I would always use silver steel, because generally it is ground to exactly the size you're buying. On the other hand, bright mild steel, or BMS as it's abbreviated to, is often slightly undersized. In this case, this is definitely one thou under spec. So I will be doing some more tests on the crankshaft and the flywheel and the pulley to see where the slop's coming from. It's probably coming from this baseboard, it's a terrible thing. I'll put that on the floor for the minute, and temporarily put the engine on its side, because underneath the engine there is a copper pipe sticking out. If you look at it, you'll see the copper pipe. It's from the water pump, so all I'm going to do is remove the water pump, and I'm going to remove this brass piece with the neat soldering on it. That, by the way, was an attempt at sarcasm. The soldering on the brass part is pretty grim, really, but the pump's quite nicely made, which once again makes me think that this particular builder liked making the parts, but didn't much like fitting them together. If you look at this brass component, you can see that the parts have been shaped, probably beaten round a former, and then soldered together in an appalling fashion, and it's only soft solder, it's really not difficult to get it neat. So now that there's no longer anything protruding underneath the engine, I can sit it flat on the bench and have a good look at it. There's some dodgy grinding on the bed plate just below this bearing, but the worst part is not on the bench, the worst part is now on the floor. Look at this. As you can see here, the dial test indicator indicates that the crankshaft is not bent, but it really didn't matter whether it was bent or not because I've removed it from the crank web. The shaft was held in with some Loctite, which is a great way of doing it, I do it all the time, but I would normally cross-pin the crank web as well. This wasn't cross-pinned, which made it very easy to just warm up the part and tap out the crankshaft. Here's the new piece of silver steel that I'm going to use, and I'm just doing a test fit in the bearing blocks to make sure it does fit, and it does, and it feels good. The piece of silver steel needs to be 7 inches long to match the original, and then I will Loctite it into the crank web, but I'm also going to cross pin it with a taper pin. I'm really not happy with this crude grinding on the bed plate. I don't actually know what function it serves, because it doesn't seem to foul anything anyway, but it's there. What I'm doing is using a small grinder in my mini drill to tidy it up and make it look like it's meant to be there. And here I'm finishing off the job using a small drum sander and it's looking much better already. Over now to the main beam. This beam has one or two issues, some minor, some major. The minor issues are the fact that some of the holes are not exactly in the centre of the casting, but the main issue is that the beam itself is not in the centre of the engine. The main shaft in the centre of the beam is now in the right position. It was not in the right position at all. If you look in one of the previous episodes, you'll see how I moved it across. Now the main shaft is in the correct position, things are a lot better, but I could just do with a tiny bit more to move the beam slightly over. I don't intend to move the position of the centre shaft again. It's looking like there's just enough slack in the centre bearings to move the beam across a fraction more. And I do mean a fraction. I need such a small amount of movement to the left. It's an optical illusion really, because the builder has removed some material from the left hand side of the beam, but not from the right. So really now, when I look at this, if I was to remove the material from the right hand side of the beam, it's more or less in the centre. When I temporarily fit one of the original pins, I can see how much better the main beam is. It's lining up with the centre of the piston rod, which is what I wanted to do. But neither the beam itself or the piston rod are lining up with the sides of this horseshoe shaped piece of metal. It's almost as though it's in the wrong place. So I'm going to have a look at this to see how tight this support shaft is. 
I'm beginning to figure out the puzzle, I think. I don't actually know what all the parts are called on a beam engine because I don't work on them very often, but this horseshoe-shaped piece of metal is in the wrong place. It's pushing over to the right-hand side. If I take it that the cylinder is in the correct position, which it is, because cast into the bed plate is a mounting flange, then what I need to do is adjust the position of this horseshoe-shaped part so that this piston rod is exactly in the centre of the two sides. As you can see, the two shafts that stick out from the piston rod are much closer to the left than to the right. So what I think's happened is that the builders got very confused with this and thought, aha, if I move the beam to the right, the motion will pull this over to the right-hand side and everything will be fine, but of course it's not. One thing's for certain, I need to find the root cause of this problem before I can put it right. The first thing I'm doing here is putting a shim in the end of the horseshoe shaped piece to see how easy it is to move it across. This is not the fix, it's just a temporary measure. I could have used a screwdriver blade, but a piece of shim is more civilised. What would be really useful is if the support standard that goes from the cylinder to the horseshoe shaped piece was actually in the centre. Look where the hole's been drilled. It's definitely to the left. If I was to make this hole bigger, or needle file it out and make it oval, that would definitely allow some more movement to the left. I'm not asking for a massive amount of movement to the left. When I put a little bit of pressure on it, as you can see it moves quite easily. The first thing I did was to check the alignment of the machine part of the column, and that's okay, that's where it's supposed to be, because at first I thought, oh the column's twisted, this is an easy fix, yeah, of course it is. As usual, what I'm not going to do is bodge it, I'm going to get to the root of the problem and put it right. Just making this whole structure lever to the left is not what I want to do. I'm not going to shim it, I'm not going to machine bits off. There's a simple solution, and I've got a good idea what it is. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Here's another look at that lovely wooden base.